Thank you, Rebecca. Um, for those who were joining us maybe for the first time uh, and didn't go to part one, my name is Aaron Ortiz. I'm with WGR Southwest. Uh, we're an environmental health and safety company. I'm a compliance specialist. I, my specialty is the industrial general stormwater permit. And we talked about that in part one about the history, about what are the requirements that the permit is asking for. And now the second one, the second one is what I call the how to. Okay, so this workshop is going to discuss the monitoring requirements for the IGP. So just like the, the first part was the what's this IGP all about, this part's going to be how we're supposed to apply it. It's going to tell you, okay, what are we expected to do? Okay, and that's why I titled it, what am I expected to do? So there's a lot of information that we packed into this, so I'm going to be racing through it, um, and hopefully we'll have time at the end for questions, at least I'm hoping for that. But there's a lot of information that we need to go through. So in the previous section, we talked about um, section uh, 10 of the general permit. This time we're going to talk about section 11 of the general permit. We're going to talk about the monitoring section. Um, we're going to talk about what's required. Okay. So there's the outline of our, our study. First of all, let's talk about terminology because what you and I say and how we say things is often different than what a regulatory person would say or, or how it's defined in the general permit. So let's get some general terminologies and definitions uh, on the board first so that we were all on the same page. Discharge is a stormwater or non-stormwater which water occurs when it flows off the facility or flows into a conveyance system that flows off site. In other words, if water leaves your property either from a point of discharge, like you know, like I said, an outfall or what I, by the way, again, like I said before, I use the term outfall interchangeably with a, a term of point of discharge. Okay, so if I use those to, to me, it's interchangeable. I know that technically outfall goes to the ocean. I understand that, but I use that in terms of individual facilities as well. So that's just my back and forth. So it's water or fluid that leaves your property, whether it leads to a drain that leaves your property or leaves out a gate or out a fence or whatever, that's your point of discharge, okay? And a point of discharge is a point where water leaves. So a discharge is water or fluid leaving your property. So like I said before, if it doesn't leave, it's not a discharge. And that comes in handy when we talk about the monthly inspections, because one of the things you're supposed to do is say, hey, is there nostril water leaving my property? Well, if you have a puddle somewhere, but it's not leaving, it's not a discharge until it actually leaves your property. Impound is when you contain or hold on to water, okay? So discharge is water leaving your property, point of discharge, or sometimes I may say, like I said, outfall for the sake of terminology. That's where water leaves your property. And then impound is when you hang on to your water, okay? So let's jump right into it. Monthly visual observations and inspections. The permit expects you to do uh, a monthly inspection. Okay, the monthly inspection I refer to as a as a nostril water and BP status inspection. Why? And it, it needs to be conducted a minimum of once once per calendar month. Okay, we recommend waiting towards the end of the month to do your inspection, or because that way you can, if something happens later in the month and you did an earlier inspection, you have to go back and redocument it. So if you can. Unless you see something occur, it needs to be conducted at least once every calendar month. Okay, it has to be done during daylight business hours. Now that's critical because stormwater inspections are different from this, and that stormwater inspections can happen whenever you have a discharge, whereas monthly inspections have to be done on, on uh, during daylight business hours on a day with no rain, no precipitation. So monthly has to be done once a month during daylight business hours. So if you're a 24 hour, if you're a 24 seven facility, okay, if you're, if you're there at 24 seven, um, you can't do a monthly inspection uh, at four o'clock in the morning because it's dark. It needs to be done when the sun's up. And then it has to be done on a day without rain, without precipitation. So for some higher elevations, like those without snow, okay? So there are two components to the monthly inspection. One. You're observing for non water discharges that may be leaving. Okay, why is that important? Because we're going to talk about there are certain types of non water which are allowed to leave. And in my regular training, I kind of go over in a little detail what those trainings are. I can't do that here because we don't have the time for that. But irrigation, potable water, different things, those are, uh, those are authorized to leave your property as long as they leave relatively clean. Okay. 
And I, rel I say relatively clean because uh, one of each property, it has to it has, it, there are certain criteria that needs to meet for that to happen. So you can't just let water leave, even if it's a authorized on summer discharge, it's only authorized if it leaves relatively clean. And there's, there's a whole caveat on that, um, which we need to get into. So you need to look for non-storm water, something in your property. And also you need to inspect areas exposed to storm water and make sure that the BMPs are in place. So this is critical because uh, many times people put BMPs, they'll put different best magic practices. Remember we talked about in section one, uh, as a recap, BMPs are things that you do or things that you build to reduce or eliminate pollutants in the storm water, okay? So the structural ones, things like, for example, say you put some sort of um, uh, filtration sock around your drains or whatever, you wanna make sure that every month those are in place and they're working. If you have drain, drain inserts or if you have, uh, for example, if you have a, if you have some sort of separator, you know, do they need to be cleaned out? These are things that your monthly inspection should look for. Another thing I recommend doing is uh, take a look at your spill kits. Make sure your spill kits are properly uh, filled. So that way, if you do have a spill, you know that you have enough materials to be able to respond to that. So the monthly inspection is an ideal time to do that. So, but for the permit's sake, it says you need to look for nostril water. And if you do have nostril water leaving, you need to determine, is this something that's authorized to leave? Or is this something that's not authorized to leave? If it's not authorized to leave, you need to stop that discharge as soon as possible and keep it from happening again. If it is authorized to leave, then the permit requires you to try to minimize it if possible, okay? Um, for example, I have a client where they had a sprinkler system that they in, in, uh, installed for their whole facility. It's hundreds and hundreds of gallons to just to test it. And the local fire department required that they test it weekly while well, it was causing a marsh in their front yard the front area where they parked cars and where people walked, it became a hazard for both vector re reasons and also for uh, just health reasons. So basically what they had to do was they had to discharge the, the, air, the fire suppression water directly from their outfall whenever they would test the system. They say, well, you're not minimizing it. Well, if you remember in, the, in section one, we talked about to the extent feasible. It wasn't feasible for them to continually dump hundreds of gallons of water every week on their facility. It was causing a major problem. And the water was clean, and fire suppression water is an allowable discharge as long as it leaves relatively clean. So um, they discharged it directly to their outfall because they had no choice. So again, that's what the whole point of your SWEP is. Your SWEP explains here's what we're doing, why we're doing it. So one, um, you look for nostril water. If it's leaving, you determine what is it? Is it authorized or not authorized? And then two, Look at your area, look at your best manner practices. Are we doing these things? Are we sweeping? Are we doing these things? Are we practicing? Are there drifts that need to be addressed? Is there anything that needs to be addressed? Do we need to do, how's the berms? How's the roof? Is there a hole in the roof that needs to be? All those things are something that you take a survey of once a month, okay? You're looking for indications of current or prior non unauthorized uh, non-storm or discharge. So in other words, if you walk around and nothing's flowing off property, discharging off property at the time, but then you see staining or evidence that something left your property, you need to determine, was this authorized water? Was it just irrigation water that left or it, it, maybe a air conditioning condensate that left? I have one client, former client, because I got him out of the permit because they no longer need to have permit coverage. But I have one client where they used to have air conditioning units that would constantly drip, drip down to one area of their property and it would actually leave the property. And so, uh, but it was very minimal, but still it left the property. So if it was discharged, they had to document it. Uh, but it was authorized. So, and often you'd see the water go. Well, there are many times I've seen, I've walked up where I saw staining and they go, ooh, this is something left the property. And I brought it to the attention of someone and they said, and they went there and they, and they stopped whatever it was that was not authorized. So uh, you need to look for, is there any, not so water leaving, okay, is there any indications of what had left? And if something did leave, was it authorized? Okay, and if it wasn't authorized, then you need to stop it. And if you want to get into all the details of, of the conditions for authorized on storm water, you can go to permit section uh, four, where it goes in detail what's allowed because there's the whole, again, my, my full training has that, but we don't have time in this training to go over nuances, but ones that are allowed to leave with potable water, uh, which is drinking water, uh, air conditioning condensate, storm suppression, fire suppression water. Um, if you have a fire, if you're in the middle of a serious fire and water leaves, even if it's nasty looking, as long as your local municipality doesn't disallow it because they're allowed to. Um, uh, if it's, 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 as far as the general permit is concerned, it's considered authorized. Now, 
quick caveat, okay. If, for example, the, the general permit allows you to have irrigation leave your property as long as it leaves relatively clean, as long as pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers are used in conjunction with manufacturing specifications, and it doesn't pick up pollutants along the way. So relatively clean. But your local city or state says, you know what, even though the, 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 your local city, for example, or county says, you know, I know the state permit allows for irrigation to the property, but we say as a city or as a county, irrigation is no longer allowed to leave your property and discharge off site. They are allowed under the Clean Water Act to make things more stringent than the general permit, not just less. So if they say you're not allowed to discharge uh, irrigation anymore, then even though you can't pull up your general permit and say, hey, general permit allows me to discharge. Well, that is as long as your local municipality doesn't make it no longer authorized. So if you have that list of things, potable water, irrigation, um, uh, drinking water, uh, air conditioning condensate, uh, fire suppression water. If those leave, the permit says it's okay, but if your local municipality says no, it no longer is authorized. Okay, just want to let you know that. You need to inspect outdoor industrial equipment in areas, you know, uh, look for the BMPs, make sure you think uh, might be potential pollutant. Um, so now let's talk about, part of my things covered. Let's talk about stormwater observations. Okay. Now, remember with with uh, monthly inspections, you're required to do those once a month during a day without rain during daylight business hours. Okay. Stormwater observations are different. They need to be conducted at each discharge location during sa uh, sampling with the follow up to be addressed. So, for example, if uh, when you grab samples, you need to do your observations at the same time. Okay. If you have a discharge, uh, we're going to talk about the number of discharge required. So, say you're say um, you, you grab a sample because you have to get your you know your four for your for the total year or two for the first half of the year. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, that you need to make sure that when you're grabbing samples, you're doing stormwater observations day or night. So, if you're a twenty four seven facility and you have a discharge at midnight, you're supposed to do observations of that discharge. Make sure the inspections. Um, Visually observe and record the presence or absence of floating or suspended materials, oil and grease, discoloration, turbidity, which is like cloudiness, orders, trash, basically sources of any kind of, uh, of anything that might be other than stormwater. You need to make sure you document uh, why no observations were done. For example, let's just say you have several places where water could leave. I have many clients where they have several outfalls, but some outfalls take a lot of rain before it, or excuse me, points of discharge. Uh, points of discharge where water leaves, but it takes a lot more rain for this point of discharge to leave than another point of discharge to leave. Okay, so if they have an outfall, basically the easiest way to document that is when you grab a sample on your chain of custody, mark next to the, I would line out the out, the outfall or the point of discharge that doesn't have a discharge and say no discharge. Basically, in other words, there wasn't there wasn't any flow, nothing left the property there. Okay, um, and you need to explain in your report any uncompleted sampling event. So if you if you blow it, you miss it, you need to explain hey. Um, we blew it. We should have did observations that we didn't. But you can't just leave it there. The permit wants you to say, okay, you know what? We, we missed these observations. Here's how we plan to not have that happen again. So you, you put your hat in your hand. If you don't do your observations, say, well, in the airport, well, we didn't do an observation of this discharge. However, here's how we plan to make that better. So they want you not just to say, yeah, we missed it, but here's how we plan so it won't happen again. Okay, qualifying storm event. Okay, this is a big one. We're gonna take a little time to chew on this because it, it can be confusing at times. A qualifying event really is not that hard to find initially, but you'll see how it applies later. It has to produce flow from at least one drainage area, okay? Um, and uh, back in 2017, the water board defined this as flow from any outfall or any point of discharge. So um, if you have water leaving your property, uh, it, ha it has to have enough flow to be able to collect the sample. So if the water comes out and just kind of inches to the drain and just kind of rubs a little bit and you can't get a, a sample bottle in there and actually collect the flow because it's just so minimal, that's not a qualifying discharge. It has to be enough for you to actually have flow, okay? And it has to have at least 40 hours prior to that with no discharge. So if you had a lot of rain on Monday and there's flow and you, you grab the sample, 
you can't grab a sample on Tuesday if there's another rain comes through because it hasn't been 48 hours since the last discharge ended. Okay, so it has to be 48 hours since the last discharge ended before you can grab another sample. But if you have a, if you have a heavy rain that comes on Monday and you collect the sample, and then two days later or, days later, or, or 48 hours or more later, uh, another storm comes through and you have another discharge, you're welcome to grab another sample as long as it has 48 hours since the last discharge. Okay, so to sum up the QSC, a qualified storm event flow and 48 hours flow and 48 hours it has to have enough flow to grab a sample and it has to be preceded by at least 48 hours with no discharge now um there was a guidance document that came out from the general permit back in 92 but that's when they first started grabbing samples here in california the general permit came out and people were like how do we do this we've never done this before so the epa came out with a guidance document and in that that particular one they came out with one later on but in that particular document basically they said well if you have a facility that's primarily paved which includes like roofs or buildings if it's primarily paved and most of the surfaces are impermeable it takes about a tenth of an inch for you to have enough flow to grab a sample okay and we found at wgr that um that's primarily true if you have a primarily facility that's paved and and, and uh, pretty much it takes about a tenth of an inch to flow now they don't put a tenth of an inch in the permit because they know every facility is different i have some paid facilities where it takes a lot more rain for it to flow just because of the way the place is designed so that's just a rule of thumb it's a general rule it's not a hard fast rule but we find in general that uh it does take up if you're primarily paved and you're all covered and you have a lot of impermeable impermeable areas in other words, water doesn't soak in very well. That about, <coughs> excuse me, about a tenth of an inch, water will flow off property. But again, that's not written into the permit because every facility is different. I have one client in the Port of Stockton where it takes a half an inch almost before they have enough flow or enough rain to get flow. So everybody's different. That's why you're the expert in your facility. You tell me how much rain does it take for you to grab a sample? How much rain does it take for you to have flow? And that's for you to determine. Um, the, everybody, every facility is different. That's what makes you so unique. Just like people are unique, facilities are unique. You only need to collect the sample if there's a discharge, water or fluid leaving your property. If there is no discharge, sampling is not required. Okay? This, this is a, I mentioned this in the previous one, we're going to go over it again. It's a surface waters permit, which means water leaving your property, discharging off your property, either through a drain or off directly off your property to a surface waters of the United States. Okay. And I have a lot, I we used to have a former client years ago. They're no longer clients, but they do everything internally, which is, you know, I'm happy for them. But at the time, uh, before they got uh, an internal person to do the work, uh, they were grabbing samples and they came to us and said, hey, you know, we have some bad numbers on our samples. And so uh, a member of our, our staff went out there and they were like, okay, well, where's your, your outfall? And then they go, outfall? Yeah, you know, you're putting discharge. What does water leave your property? They go, oh, well, well, it doesn't leave. It goes to this pond. So he was like, then why did you grab a sample? Well, because it rained. Well, let's take a look. So he looked and sure enough, they, held, they, had, they had a whole drainage system and everything goes to this big pond they have. And while the pond didn't meet the notice of non applicability size, it was a really big pond, and all their water went to that pond. And he was like, well, you really shouldn't grab a sample unless water leaves your property. And so since then, they've monitored it, and they keep on tabbing it, and to, this, and to date, since forever, they haven't actually had a discharge because their pond has been able to, it has a really good percolation rate, and they're able to keep all water on site. Um, so make sure that unless water is actually leaving your property or you have enough flow towards leaving your property, you do not need to grab a sample. This is a surface water permit. If it doesn't leave your property, it's not a, it's not a discharge under this general permit. Required to be collected. Okay, so collecting samples. Let's talk about collecting samples, okay? How many samples do you need to collect, okay? Uh, it's a stormwater year, okay? Let's talk about the stormwater year. Stormwater year starts July 1st ends june 30th starts july 1st ends june 30th okay so in that time the permit breaks it down into two halves the first half is between july and december and the second half is between january and june and the general permit says you need to conduct uh samples to the first half and do the second half we'll get into that okay but 
when a QSC happens, let's go, let's, let's back up and I'm, we're, we're, I just kind of got, I kind of jumped ahead, but we'll get back to that in a minute, guys. I jumped ahead. When the QSC happens, when you have flow, remember flow and 48 hours, remember that, flow and 48 hours. When you have enough flow to collect the sample, okay, once that, if it's during business hours, once that discharge starts, you have up to four hours from the start of discharge to collect that sample. So if uh, if I'm, I'm, I'm uh, hypothetically speaking, if my business open Monday through Friday between seven to four, Monday through Friday, and I'm open up at seven o'clock, and sometime during that day, rain starts, but not flow yet, but then enough rain comes to where I'm actually getting flow to where I can collect the sample. Once you determine flow started, which again, it's really for you to know your facility when that point is. So, and most people are honest in, on that. And I, so I hope you're honest because dishonesty is not a very wise thing to do. But as soon as you determine that there's flow, that's when the clock starts ticking. Okay, we have flow, so now we have up to four hours from that point, uh, point in discharge to grab a sample. Now here's a cautionary tale. Water starts, rain starts, you have flow, and you're like, oh, I got four hours, I'll just grab it when I can. Rain stops, flow stops. Okay, now you didn't get that sample. And let's just say you didn't you didn't get your two for the first half of the year, which we'll talk about. So now you're going to have to explain that on your report. Well, we could have gotten a sample. We had a qualifying summer event. We had flow in 48 hours. So in other words, we had flow and you had your 40 hours since the last discharge, but we just didn't grab a sample when we should have. And that's the last thing you want to do in a general permit report. Plus, a little side note, there are third parties out there that are looking for people who don't have the required number of discharges. And so you really need to be able to defend yourself. If you say you didn't have a discharge, it's because you really were watching. And especially if you have ponds, whatever, it's it's a more feasible argument to say, oh, we didn't have a discharge, okay? So uh, uh, if your facility doesn't have any ponds and, anything, and a flow happens, you if it's during business hours, you really do need to collect that sample because um, you may not get another shot at it, okay? And we'll talk about how many samples you're supposed to collect, okay, in a little bit. But the bottom line is, if you have flow and it's been 40 hours since the last discharge and, and you, you have to get your first the two, the first half of the year, two, three half of the year, you know, if you need to grab those samples, make sure, first of all, that you make sure you grab your sample. Now, if you have time to let it go through, that's fine. Um, but remember, just because you have up to four hours got a sample and you, you let the discharge stop before you have a chance to grab it, then you missed your chance. That being said, if you can wait a little bit, and we'll talk about smart sampling in the third part. Go ahead and wait a little bit, as long as you give yourself some flexibility. So remember, you have up to four hours to grab that sample, but make sure that you grab that sample. If rain stops, you gotta go out there and grab that sample before the discharge stops, okay? So uh, just a cautionary tale on that, okay? So one, if discharge starts during business hours, you have up to four hours from the start of discharge, remember, not from the start of rain, but from the start of discharge to grab that sample, okay? Two, uh, if if a discharge happens outside your business hours, but within 12 hours to start a business, and then you come in and there's flow, you have up to four hours from the start of business to collect that sample. Okay, here the people go, what? So let me go over it. If you're open Monday through Friday, seven to four, and Sunday night, rain comes in, and you know, based on your facility, because you know your facility that by around midnight, based on the rain gauges or whatever nearby, or hopefully, prefer preferably, as you went on your property, that you had uh, um, enough water, let's say, hypothetically speaking, your facility takes a half an inch for flow, because it, it, it really absorbs a lot of water. So you know that you had half an inch by midnight. Okay, so you know, okay, you know what, by midnight, we had flow. We know we had flow by midnight, because we had half an inch. Okay, so Midnight is within the 12 hours because if your business starts at seven, anything after seven o'clock is within that 12 hour period. So if you come in on Monday morning at seven o'clock and it's raining and there's flow, you have up to 11 o'clock to collect the sample because you had discharged within the previous 12 hours, okay? Now, again, if you come in at seven o'clock and there's no rain at that time, but you know earlier in the night you had discharge, and then later on that day, rain starts. And as long as the flow starts before 11 o'clock, again, you have up to four hours from the start of business. So you can click that sample up to 11 o'clock. Now, Aaron, those are, yes. We have a question that goes along with this that go, we go need to answer. If your business hours are considered office hours, um, what if your plant runs 24 seven? 
Okay, business hours are when you're producing or you're in production, okay? So if you're a facility that has production 24 seven, then regardless of your office hours, your business hours are 24 seven. That's an excellent question and I get that a lot, okay? Um, many people say, well, you know, our, our staff is here from six to 2.30 and that's when we produce, but our office is between nine and five. Well, your business hours are six to 2.30, okay? It's when you're in production. If you have production going on, if you're a 24 seven production facility, then your business hours are 24 seven, uh, regardless of what your staff or your administrative offices are doing. I, I hope that answers the question. Okay, great. Good question, thank you. Uh, thank you, Rebecca, for bringing that up. It's an excellent question. So to recap on the second half, like I said, I really like this second sample op option because you've had a night of runoff. You had a night to where the water's flowing because uh, other businesses, other things land on your property during the day and it's nice to have what we call that first flush, okay? So again, to recap, qualifying summer event, you know, flow in 48 hours. If it starts during your business hours and you click and, and you have discharge, not just rain, but discharge start, you have up to four hours to collect that sample as long as there's discharge. And again, if discharge starts, you do want to grab that sample because if it ends and you didn't grab your opportunity to get it, then you have to explain in your report why you didn't grab it. Okay. Two, if rain starts outside your business hours, but within 12 hours of the start of business, in other words, if you're seven, Monday to Friday, seven to four, and it starts anytime after 7 p.m. the night before, you come the next day, you have up to four hours from the start of up, up to 11 o'clock to collect that sample. And that second scenario is one I like because it gives you a little flush off, legal, what I call a legal flush off, okay? So you're not required to grab samples during weather, dangerous weather conditions. So if we have like fork lightning hit the ground or hurricane winds or any kind of thing that could make it dangerous, even though you have a discharge, Basically, you, you could say, you know what? This is not safe for me or my staff to be out there to grab samples right now. It's just not safe. Then you just need to document that as saying, you know, yeah, we had a discharge, but there was serious electrical storms that night that made things not safe. Or the winds were, you know, at, you know, at you know, 60 miles an hour or whatever, it had made, it was in unsafe conditions and, and it was not about to subject ourselves to a life-threatening situation. Okay. Or two. Uh, you're not you a sample may be collected um, outside your schedule business hours, but I don't recommend it. Okay, the permit doesn't require you to. Why? Because they they know that they don't want you to have to come in the middle of the night. You know, if you close up for the night and they don't want you to come in the middle of the night just to go out the stormwater sample, they want you to grab a sample when you would normally be scheduled your businesses. So, um, like like we discussed earlier. If you're if you're in production 24/7, then you're open to get samples 24/7. Okay, so you should have somebody on staff always who's who's trained in grabbing samples. Okay, uh, if you're open Monday through Friday 7 to 4, then if discharge not just rain but discharge happens after 4 o'clock, you're off the hook for that day because your scheduled business hours are already closed and your staff is gone and you shouldn't be expected to grab samples. Now again, some people say, well. You can grab samples. The permit says you're allowed to grab samples outside your business hours, and that's true. And there are some cases where I may recommend that, but for the most part, I tell people unless it happens during business hours, I recommend not collecting it personally. Okay, now let's talk about how many samples. So now we know that qualified storm event is flow in 48 hours. Okay, remember that flow. In 40 hours, you have to have enough flow. Not so you can have flow without rain, but you can't have rain. You can have rain without flow, but you can't have flow without rain. Okay, so when you have rain and then there's enough rain for flow, grab a sample. Like I think, well, what a week and a half or about a week ago, we had a storm that come through. Most of the folks I work with, there wasn't enough rain for flow. I mean, rain hit, it was sporadic. I had one client who actually grabbed a sample because they had this, they had the heavens open up right over their facility. But for most people, they had a little bit of rain, the ground got wet, but there was no flow. Okay, so it wasn't a qualifying discharge. So it has to have flow in 48 hours. When discharge happens, when water leaves your happen, you have flow, you have up to four hours to grab that sample from the start of discharge during business hours. Or if rain starts outside your business hours, like the night before, and you come the next day and it's within with the discharge happened within 12 hours, you have up to four hours from the start of business to collect that sample. And those are the ones that I really like to collect. Okay. 
So that's a recap of those. Now let's go on to how many samples you are required to collect. The general permit requires you collect two qualifying summer events, the first half of the reporting year between July and December, and two, the second half of the, the reporting year between January and June. Okay. Now, if you're part of a compliance group, which is different, that's where you, you, you have other businesses that do what you do, and you guys are all similar in what you do, you can join a compliance group. You're only required to grab one sample the first half of the year and one sample the second half of the year. Okay. But if you're not part of a compliance group, you're required to go to group two. If a QSE happens, remember, only if a qualifying storm event happens. Uh, um, last year, we had a pretty bad drought year. And many times storms came in in the middle of the night. And the majority of my clients aren't open in the middle of the night. So for them, what few storms did come through, half, more than half of them didn't come through during the time when they were open to collect that sample. Okay. So remember, a qualified storm event is dependent on your facility to a certain degree. It's when you have flow, and it's been 48 hours since the last time you have flow. Okay? So if you, if you don't collect two samples the first half of the year, which is very, very common, um, then make sure that you document, hey, there were no qualified storm events. We were watching. We're, you know, you basically, just I would document somewhere, hey, there were no discharges during, during business hours. Okay? Um, so the second half, if you, you're only, okay, we'll go back to this, but um, we'll talk about obligation, okay? But so that's what the general permit wants. If, if you can, you're supposed to grab two of the first half and two of the second half, if you can, okay? And compliance groups, one half, for, one for the first half and then one for the second half. Okay, now here's, I was trying to get ahead of myself, okay? So according to the general permit fact sheet in section 2J1, if four QSCs do not occur during the monitoring year, uh, you're not required to go up and make up for missed sample events. In other words, let's just say the first half of the year, you're only able to collect one sample because there's only one, which is very common here, especially in the Central Valley, where um, at least our part of the Central Valley, where rain comes in in the middle of the night, but really the first half of the year before January, you're lucky to get at least one sample in at all. If that's the case, you're not required on the second half of the year to grab three samples to compensate for the one you missed the first half of the year, okay? So, um, but again, if you have flow and it was during business hours or if it within the four hours, you know, at the 12 hour rule, as I call it, and you didn't collect the sample when you could have, okay, then you're going to explain to yourself why it is you had a chance to actually collect, the, you had to qualify some of it and you didn't collect, okay? And then explain how you plan not to let that happen again. But if you didn't have an actual genuine qualifying storm event, a QSE, okay, you're not required to go back and, and try to grab extra samples the second half of the year or the following year for that matter, okay? They understand that storms come and they come. Uh, they all understand that you can have five storms in a season or you can have one. And like I said, we've been in a severe drought recently. I mean, all our reservoirs are empty. So, uh, it's understandable, uh, especially in the past couple of years, if you don't get four QSCs a year, it's just unless you're, you know, you have me in a place where the rain just happens to go through, many times you will find that in some years you just can't get four samples a year. And as long as you legitimately didn't have a discharge, that's fine. Just make sure you document that somewhere. Under the general permit, there are three sampling constituents that you have to sample for, okay? So people say, okay, now I know what a qualified storm event, which is flow in 48 hours, okay? Flow in 48 hours. That's a qualified, that's a qualified storm event. And I, okay, and I grab my two samples if they're available, the first half of the year, and my two samples, second half of the year, if they're available, unless you're part of a compliance group, which is one in one. Okay, now what am I supposed to sample for? Okay, well, first of all, Everybody, if you're under NOI coverage, no, no submitted coverage, everybody has to sample for pH, okay? pH is the acidity in water, okay? Now, I don't know if you remember, but earlier I said that municipalities are allowed to make things more stringent, but not less stringent than the, than the, clean, than the, the permit. Well, a while back, um, the, the general permit, the Clean Water Act, they have a general permit for facilities or states that don't have their own permit coverage. It's called the multi-sector permit, sector being um, landfills, manufacturing, transportation, different business sectors, okay? 
And in the multi-sector permit, by the way, our general permit here in California is in many ways a reflection of the multi -sector. It really has a lot of the elements of the multi-sector permit in it. it. It's very, there are a lot of similarities. A lot of differences, but a lot of similarities. But anyway, so uh, the federal government a while back used to be in California, you can grab a, a you can do a pH, just have the lab your pH, as long as the pH is done within 24 hours, they plug your sample, you're okay. Well, the federal standard says, no, 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 from now on, we need to have pH tested within 15 minutes of collecting your sample. So California can't make things less stringent than the Clean Water Act, you know, you know the multi to permit, it has to make it as stringent or more stringent. So now everybody has to look for pH and everybody has to test for pH within 15 minutes of collecting your sample, okay? Now, let's just say, for example, you forget to test your pH, which, I, you know, which you can because most people, you don't, if your pH is, is a baseline and you're finding your pH, you can use a litmus paper. You can use pH paper to test your, your water. You don't necessarily have to have a, uh, a, a meter, which I prefer a, a pH meter myself. I think they're, they're better and safer. But regardless, the permit allows you to use litmus paper or pH paper. So really, there are very little excuse for you not to get a pH measurement when you grab your sample. Okay. Um, so, but it's better if, for, if someone forgets, as long as uh, it, if the lab processes it well, yeah, but again, you, you're really violating the permit because it's supposed to do with the humans that collect your sample. And one thing, a little side note, it's not spelled out in the permit, but I highly recommend that when you grab your, when you do your pH measurement, just document it on your chain of custody. So that way, um, it's going to be literally written along with the rest of your results, but they always have to... When you get your sample results back from the lab, they always give you a copy of your, your chain of custody with it. So it'll be actually documented there for you. So that's just kind of a side note. So everybody has to look for pH in the water. And it has to be tested within 15 minutes of collecting your sample. Everybody has to look for total suspended solids. Okay. Kind of like if you get a snow globe, you shake a snow globe, you see all that stuff floating around, that's suspended solids. That's what total suspended solids are. And everybody has to look for oil and grease. And oil and grease is just that oil and grease. Okay, so everybody, if you're in your general permit, you grab samples, at a minimum, you have to grab those three things. Another question to ask, okay, well, I'm a facility, I produce something that has, uh, I do a lot of metal fabrication. Okay, so I'm just doing my three, I'm just going to grab my three samples. Well, hold on. The permit has a few more things. By the way, for most folks, I refer to this as the infomercial permit, because if you ever did an infomercial, they say, this is the greatest coffee cup ever invented, and we'll buy you for $19.95, but wait, there's more. If you buy this today, you get something else. Well, that's kind of how the permit is. You think, okay, here's my permit, I got my requirements, but wait, there's more. Uh, and so here's that part of it. Uh, one, yeah, three basics, but you also need a sample for constituents that are listed in table one. So remember we talked about before in the previous one, your SIC code, standard and decimal classification code. It's a four digit code that's listed in attachment A of the general permit that basically says if you're in this category, you're required to, to have permit coverage. Or if you can show that you're covered, you can get an NEC or if you can dig a big enough hole where all your water goes to the hole, you can get a NONA, a nona okay, regardless. Uh, if you're if you require general permit coverage, if you have NOI coverage, and you have under you're under general permit coverage, you have to go to table one and take a look at your SIC code. And if it's listed in table one, all the extra samples listed in table one, you're required to look for. Okay. Um, the only time you can get out of that is if the water board comes out, the regional board comes to your facility, and you say, "Listen, I know according to table one, we're supposed to be looking for iron, but we have no." fabricating, we have no industrial activity that iron all out here. And if the water board agrees with you, you can discontinue sampling for that. But unless the water board gives you the thumbs up, anything listed in table one, you're required to sample along with the three basics, pH, solids, and oil and grease. Okay? So one, you're supposed to sample for any constituents listed on table one. Two, you're supposed to sample for any potential pollutants that might be likely present. So example, if you're fabricating metals and you do you work with iron and aluminum, now you have to look for aluminum. Or if you work with zinc anodes, you have to you have to look for zinc. And God forbid, if you work with copper, which copper is so ridiculously low on its requirements, but then you have to look for copper. 
Okay, so you you have to look at your industrial activities. What do we do? But what, what potential pollutants we have? And so besides these three, pH, sulfur, solids, and oil and grease, and whatever listed in table one, if we have something else we're working with, we need to add that to our list. Now the good thing about number two, let's just say you 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 think well we we work with aluminum, and so we need to list it. Okay, you look for it. After a year or two, you know, after at least, I, I prefer to have at least four samples with it, but after at least four samples, you show that, hey, we don't have a problem with aluminum. It's never been a problem. Then you can just continually sampling for that one as long as you document in your storm water pollution prevention plan that, yes, we determined that aluminum might be present. We looked at it. We've had several samples with no aluminum present. Therefore, we're discontinuing sampling of aluminum. But you have to prove it. Um, I have an expression in California. When it comes to the environment, you're guilty until proven innocent. <laughs> so uh, that's my, that's a personal feeling. So make sure that you document everything. You need to prove, you know, you make your case. So you have to, you have to sample for three. You have to sample for the table one listings, unless the water, the regional board allows you not to. But again, it has to be a regional board determination on that one. Two, you have to sample for any potential pollutants you determine might be present in stormwater. But the good about number two about samples is if you determine the ones that you think might be in there uh, aren't a problem, you can you can discontinue sampling for them. But you've got to prove it. So I would at least I would recommend at least four samples showing that this is not an issue. Okay. Three, you're supposed to apply, you're supposed to look for any TMDLs, which are listed in attachment E. If you have any industrial activities. That have a TMDL attached to it. You know, so, for example, if if you if you met, fabricate metals, iron, aluminum, something like that. I know that's an easy example. That's why I use. I work with a lot of fa fabricators. And there, and your team, you have a TMDL for iron, aluminum. You're required to look for that in your stormwater samples. But again, like like number two, if you look for those and they're not present, you can say, hey, you know, we we did four or five samples. Aluminum is not a problem. Therefore, we just continue sampling for it. Make your case. Three, three or three D listed items. Okay, in Clean Water Act Section three hundred three D, it says that states are required to do an assessment of the of their waterways and make make a potential thing of, of water bodies that might be impaired for beneficial uses. And there's a whole definition of beneficial uses. So, the water in Section three hundred three D of the Clean Water Act, it says states look at all your water bodies. If you think it might be impaired for iron, uh, beneficial uses being like uh, uh, edible, drinking water, aesthetics, uh, different things that, that are beneficial uses. If you think this water body is impaired in some way for, let's just say, iron, okay, then what you need to do is you need to put that iron as a 303D listed item. And if you any, if your facility has any industrial activities that, that may have something that's in the 303D list, you need to add that to your sampling as well. Okay, but again, like the TMDL stuff and like the number two, the potential pollutants, if you grab a several samples showing it's not an issue, you can discontinue sampling for it, but you got to document that in your sweat. Okay, constituents added due to effluent limitation guidelines. So there are certain facilities in attachment F that they, because of what they do, they have ELGs that apply to them. Okay, uh, air, airports, if you do de-icing, you have ELGs. If you do asphalt emulsion, you have to do ELGs. Uh, if you're a power generation facility, you have ELGs that apply to you. Okay, so different types of facilities, based on their SIC code and industrial activity, they may be required to add ELGs to the facility. Okay, and that's different depending on who you are and what you have. Okay, and then also if you have any uh, toxic chemical ident identified as, as reportable chemicals. So there was my understanding there's two different reporting levels, but if you if you report on I think it's form R, don't quote me on that. But if you if you have a, a certain quantity that you're required to add that that uh, TRI reporting chemical to your facility. So if you have a TR reporting chemical and you you and it's it's at a level where you have to report it, then you need uh and I believe it is form R. Don't again, I believe it's form R. If you report on form A, I don't think it, it's necessary. It's the form R that's the trigger according to the regulations. If you have to report it, um, then you need to add that to your second regimen until you can prove, hey, it's not our stormwater. Just like the other ones, just like the TMDLs, those items, potential pollutants you determine might be present. 
the TR report, like chemicals, if you have anything that might be in the TR listing, you've got to add that to your sample regimen. And then again, if you can prove it's not an issue, you can discontinue, but you got to prove it. Okay. So let's talk about discharge standards. Okay. The permit has standards for discharge. You grab samples for a reason because you have to compare it to a standard. Okay. You have a standard. Um, and there's different standards. You have what they call NELs, numeric action levels. Some people call them nulls, but I'm not fond of that term. This is personal, but I prefer NEL. Um, TM, TMDL related numeric action levels called TNELs. Okay, those came to effect July 1st, 2020. And numeric effluent limits, NELs, which also became effective as of July 1st of 2020. Okay, so there are three different strategies to look at NELs, TNELs, and NELs, okay? Let's think about NALs. There's two types of NALs. You have an annual NEL. In other words, what you do is, you, for example, uh, iron, the annual uh, is, is one, one milligram per liter, okay? So if you grab, look for iron, and you click it over, you get your four samples for the year, two the first half, two the second half, if you add them all up and get the average, if the average is below one, you're below the NEL, you're fine. If the average is above one, you have an NEL exceedance for iron and you go to level one for iron, okay? Um, so that's just one example there. Uh, another example is uh, uh, total submitted solids. Their annual is uh, 100 milligrams per liter. So if you if you collect total spent solids and you average out by the time you grab all your samples and you average out below 100, you're below the NEL. If you go over 100, then you have an NEL exceedance and you go to level one for total spent solids. With that being said, there's another kind of NEL and it's called an instantaneous maximum NEL. Okay, instantaneous is where you have two or more NELs that that exceed the NEL maximum. So pH does not have instantaneous uh, uh, annual and uh, pH is only instantaneous pH is a range it has to you when you grab samples your pH needs, needs to be between six and nine pH units so if you grab a sample one time if you have again if you have two samples that exceed the instantaneous maximum you go to level one as of July 1st the following monitoring year so during, during right now if you're getting exceedances you go to level one as of July 1st next year Okay, it's the following start of the year that you go to that next level. So if you grab pH, okay, you grab a sample, and you see you get your form for the year. And the first sample you grab, say, next week, you know, in, in October, and it's it's 5.5, okay? That's outside the 6.9 range, okay? And then you're fine the second sample you collect maybe November or December. Then after the new year, you grab a sample in January, and then you grab a sample in February. And the February sample, the, you have a pH of uh again below six or maybe you have a ph of for whatever reason above 9.0 if you have two phs outside the range you go to level one for ph as of july 1st 2023 okay so that's instantaneous it's two samples that go above the maximum now that's those are hard to do because for example toast about solids the the instantaneous maximum for solids is 400 milligrams per liter so that's pretty dirty. So if you have two samples over 400 milligrams per liter, you're automatically going to level one for, for solids. Okay. Now, with that being said, if you think about it, if you grab a sample and it's 400 twice, you know that your average is going to, your average is going to already be over 100, which is the annual. So even if you only get one over 400, you're probably going to meet, you're, you may not have an instantaneous, but you'll probably still be over the annual average and go to level one for solids regardless. Okay. So pH is only instantaneous. Total spin in solids has both an annual and an instantaneous maximum. And oil and grease has both an annual and instantaneous maximum. Oil and grease, uh, its um, annual is 15 milligrams per liter. So as long as you average below 15 milligrams per liter, you're fine. Now, if you have a, a spike of oil and grease above 25 milligrams per liter, that's the instantaneous. If you have two over 25, you're going to level one. 
But if they say you have one that's extremely high, but then the rest are low, and it averages below the 15 milligrams per liter, then you're going to stay at baseline. Okay. But remember, everybody starts off at baseline. So, so instantaneous has to have two parameters, even if it's two alpha. So let's just say you grab only one sample because you only have one, one discharge, but you have several alpha and two different alpha have two different exceedances, then you're you go to level one for that. So two regardless. Okay. Annual is averaging. Okay. So NALs, okay, NALs are targets to help a facility determine their discharge stormwater quality and respond with BMPs to improve the water quality. My personal opinion on this one is I do like NALs. Why? Because it get it, you look at your water, you say, okay, look, we have issues. How can we fix this? Okay, whereas uh, NALs are not a violation of the general permit as long as you respond to them properly. Okay. TNALs are like NALs, they are targets just like NALs, but they're only instantaneous. A TNEL, which, are, which will be listed for you in attachment E, which here in the Central Valley, we don't have that issue right now, but down in Southern California and over on uh, uh, San Francisco Bay Area, they have TNELs there, okay? So a TNEL is based on your TMDL and based on TMDL. So they'll be listed on attachment E, okay? If you have a TNEL, those are only instantaneous. They're not, they're not annual, okay? So if you have two TNELs over the TNEL average, uh, you, have, uh, you go to level one for TNAL. Okay, so that's what we talked about there. Basically, there are no annual averages for TNALs, just just instantaneous. Okay, any else? I really do not like any else. I think they're kind of productive, but that's my personal opinion. Any else, unlike TNALs and any else, are limits. And if you go over the any else, you're in violation of permit and you're subject to fines. Okay. So uh, at NEL are, are a violation of general permit and must be responded to in accordance with water quality based correction actions as outlined in section 20B, okay? NEL exceedances are applied like NELs and TNLs in that they are instantaneous maximums and have no annuals, okay? NELs are based on receiving water quality standards, okay? Outlined attachment E in the general permit. Due to being a general permit violation, having an NEL, an NEL, makes you subject to uh, fines and penalties, okay? Now, one point is the Water Board in 2020 came out with what they call compliance, uh, things you can do uh, to try to get around these. Um, and you, you have what you do on-site compliance or you can do an off-site compliance. They're, they have challenges. Again, I don't have time in this training, especially since we, only, we have only a few minutes left in this to go over that in more detail. But the bottom line is you can do offsite compliance or you can do onsite compliance. Both have their strings attached, both have their issues. Onsite um, on compliance has a lot of monitoring and things you have to do. If you send your water to a PHEW or something else that will process your water for you, that's probably which is less available for most people. But if you are able to do that, that's probably the better option because then you can get an agreement with a, a, a facility that will that will process your water for you and that releases you from a lot of the permit requirements. But uh, NELs are um, you need to plan for those. You need to if you think you, if you think even think you're going to violate them, you need to start putting things in now and try to stop it because once you have one, it's a violation of the permit and you have to you have to respond to it. Um, and unfortunately, with third parties, I. I have real issues because as soon as you have an NEL, they're going to come in and want to sue you on behalf of the environment uh, because you have a permit violation. And here you are trying to get your act together, and now you have another third party that comes in and makes things worse. So, um, in my opinion, so uh, if you have if you're in an area where NELs could be an issue, um, again, again, our staff in Southern California they deal with this stuff all the time. This is their this is their area of expertise, and I guarantee you. Uh, if you're down in Southern California and you need help, um, just kind of a quick plug for WGR. We can help you. Or find yourself a good quiz who can help you respond to these NELs. Okay? Um, that That's it for this uh, thing. We have a few minutes left. As there is any questions I can address. I know we went over a lot of information relatively quickly. 
And I couldn't go into the compliance options issues because it's just not enough time, but we touched on it. Is there any questions? Anything we can go over? There are some questions, Aaron. Um, there's some big ones. So let's see. I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them. Uh -oh. But let's see. Can you discuss the sampling and analysis reduction certification and how it affects how often you're required to sample? Oh, okay. So if you grab samples, and if I remember if I understood your question correctly, if you grab samples and every time um, I think you're talking about frequency reduction, where you're talking about the number of samples you have to collect. Um, if you can uh, show that you're constantly and continually below the NALs without a problem, then you can make an argument in your set that, look, we have samples, we have four consecutive or more samples. Uh, it doesn't give you, basically, we have four more showing that, hey, well, I like four, personally. You don't necessarily spell out four, but I like four. We, we've proven that our, our, our stormwater samples are safe. Therefore, as of this monitoring year, we're going to go one sample the first half of the year and one sample the second half of the year because we've proven our stormwater discharges are clean. Now, if you go to, uh, if you do a reduction and you find that you have an exceedance, you go back to two per half of each year again. So you're allowed, if you can show that you are consistently below the NELs, and and you're good to go you can drop down you can drop down to one sample the first half of the year and one sample the second half of the year okay unless you have an exceedance once you have an exceedance you have to go back to two samples the first half of the year and two samples the second half of the year Next and question. that goes hand in hand with another question which says is for non-detects for any analyte the requirement to stop sampling for that specific analyte the remit doesn't call out, call out for it calls out for, for you to go back to baseline from a level one, but it doesn't call out the exact number that you need to have to justify going to one sample per, per season. However, we do recommend four because it kind of goes along with the spirit of the permit. So the permit does not say you have to have four consecutive samples at non-detect before you can go down to grabbing one sample first half of the one sample second half of the year, okay? Or, uh, you have to have four data text before you can drop a voluntary. Remember, we talked about voluntary ones that the 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 ones that that you think you add to your your sampling because you know it's part of industrial industrial activity. Again, we recommend that you get four data text. That way, you're really justified in proving that you're not a problem. And the permit sets that bar when it comes to level one reduction back to baseline, but it doesn't call out a specific number. So, do you have to have four ND uh, data text before you can go drop down to uh, before you can discontinue sampling for a parameter or reduce your samples from two to each half to one half? No, but it's highly recommended. Okay. If you sample for an, a constituent that may be potential pollutant source and find it in low levels, do you have to continue to sample for that constituent even if it is very low? Judgment call. Um, if you have a constituent, and it's so below the NEL that it's virtually, you know, it's almost just, it's, it's a, you know, where you, you have to, uh, where it's, uh, it's at the MDL, the method protection limit, but that's the only place it is, then you can make the argument that it's not, it's not an issue, okay? Um, however, if you grab samples and it's below the NEL, but it's close to being at the NEL, then no, I would continue to sample for it because it has the potential to go over. Okay, so this is a judgment call on your part. If it's extremely low, continually, it never, it never crosses the NEL, and it's been to the point where it's almost on the detector, close to it on a continual basis, then in my book, it's justifiable to discontinue sample for that, okay? But again, if you grab samples and it's close to being the NEL or where it's, you know, it's not extremely low, then you want to continue sampling for it until you can really prove it's not an issue. And again, if it's, below the, if it's below the NEL all the time, and you make the judgment call to discontinue something for it, you can, okay? That's your choice. But I just want to let you know that um, uh, if it's close to the NEL a lot, the water board can come in and tell you to sample for it again. So you can discontinue something for something, but they, they may remind you, the water board can come in at any time and say, no, no, you need to sample for that again. I've had some clients where the, they discontinue something for stuff, but they were really great. But the water board came back and said, no, no, I want you to continue sampling for that, okay? So yes, you can stop. But remember, it's always subject to the water board's judgment. They may want you to come back and sample it again. So 
again, judgment call on your part. There are a lot more questions, but we're running out of time. So if you have any questions, feel free to email Aaron. He's happy to answer them for you. So go ahead. You see his email on the screen, um, or you can contact us through the, our website. There is a contact form that you can fill out. So we will get that question to Aaron either way. But thank you so much for joining us. We are really happy to have you here. Um, there is another workshop starting at 10 o'clock about water flows uphill. And this is a construction workshop. So it's talking about construction sampling, BMPs, and all of that fun stuff. Then part three of Aaron's IGP basics workshop is at 11. And then at 2 p.m., we have navigating IGP TMDL compliance and treatment options. And then there is one last workshop at 3 p.m., which is about compost-based BMPs and helping cities meet their organics diversion requirements. And again, that's at three, and those are um, Pacific Standard Times. So if you're in a different time zone, um, go ahead and check out our website for more information about that to get the correct times. But thank you so much for joining us. Again, this is going to be recorded and posted on our website in about 24 to 48 hours. So thank you, Aaron, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca.